you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Peter's words to the church in his day. How interesting. Because how many of us hear those words and say, boy, I love to suffer. How many of you wake up in the morning and say, boy, I can't wait to suffer today. Does anybody do that? Does anybody look at life and say, I hope things don't go my way. I hope that I have an embarrassing day. And I hope that, well, I just hope that I'm able to suffer as much as possible. Well, no, of course not. None of us would say that. And we hear these words of Peter and we say, are you serious? Are you serious, Peter? Because not only does Peter say that we should welcome suffering, but did you notice that? Praise God that you bear that name. Praise God when you suffer. How many of us are willing to praise God when we suffer? Well, I don't think any of us really like to do so. Not one of us likes to suffer, much less praise God while we're suffering. In fact, when you think about it, when you think about your life, you want the opposite to be true. You want things to go well. You want things to go successfully. And you most often praise God when things are going your way, right? Well, it's interesting. Because here we sit as Christians today looking at these verses. And we hear these verses and we hear these words of Peter and we think to ourselves, Peter You maybe need to go back to the drawing board. You maybe need to figure things out again. But just for a minute, consider who he was originally writing to. In fact, think about his original audience. That church that he was writing to was under persecution. I'm not just talking about persecution from the Romans. Persecution from those who are outside of the faith, enemies of the faith. But we're talking about persecution from their own brothers and sisters. See, these were people who were formerly Jews. These were people who had been part of the Jewish faith, and who had been rejected by their own families, been rejected by their friends, those closest to them. And here Peter is saying to them, rejoice, rejoice that you have been rejected. Rejoice that you are suffering. And we don't like to hear that, do we? Now, sometimes we'll find solace in the fact that, well, other people suffer too, right? As much as our our unchristian, sinful nature dwells within us, at times we'll at least look at others and say, well, at least they are suffering. At least I'm not alone in my suffering. Sadly, that is true for many people. In fact, we look at others who we think deserve to suffer. Maybe we don't think about it that way. We don't say it that way. But we look at those who are much worse than we are in this world. You probably have someone who comes to your mind when you think of your own life who is living a worse life than yours who you would say, well, at least I don't do what he does. At least I don't say what she does. But it's hard when it seems like those people who we perceive as worse than us seem to have it better than us. All of you got up this morning and you left your home. And if you're like me when you're leaving your house, you notice that some of your neighbors use Sunday morning Not to go to church, not to go to Bible school, not to spend time together with fellow Christians, but they spend time mowing their lawn, watering their garden, cleaning their house, things like that. As I was leaving this morning, I know that's what my neighbors were doing. And it's hard for us when we see people like that who seem to be blessed as we struggle with our mortgage, as we struggle to make payments on our cars. You see them pull into their driveway with a new vehicle. You see them with a load of quads that they go out to the, to the desert with. You constantly see them bringing in new things. Maybe, again, it's not what we actually say, but perhaps a little bit of our three-year-old self comes through. We fold our hands across our chest, and we look at them, and we stomp our foot, and we say, It's not fair! It's not fair, is it? We're doing the right thing. We're going to church. We're spending time with fellow Christians. So why are things better for them? Why do good things happen to these bad people? As we look at that, it's hard for us. Because we struggle with seeing these good things that happen to people. And in fact, we struggle a little more when we not only read Peter's words to praise the Lord in our suffering, but when we hear Jesus' own words in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus' words in Matthew 5 say, You have heard that it was said. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and, the, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So not only are we to praise the Lord in our sufferings, but we're also to pray for our enemies, that we are to celebrate that the Lord blesses them. How hard is this for many of us? How hard is it for us to look at our enemies, those people who we detest, maybe not just our neighbors, but people who we dislike, who have harmed us in some way, and pray for them? How about you? Do you pray for your enemies? Do you pray for those people who have hurt you? Do you pray for those people who have offended you, who have done something that just is unforgivable? Oftentimes, instead of responding in love, we respond in anger, don't we? We respond in anger because we want God to show them judgment. They're not living the Christian life. They're not behaving as a Christian should. We want God to judge them. Instead of praying for them that God would lead their hearts to forgiveness, lead their hearts to Him, we pray that they would find judgment. Many times, we as Christians, we, or if we don't pray for them, We just want them to get their up and coming, what they deserve. Kind of dangerous for our Christian faith. Because we also respond then in times with frustration, don't we? We look at God and we say to him, God, I have kept your law as much as I could. I have come to church. I have studied your word. I have gone to other people in need and shared your gospel with them. So why, why, why not me? Why are things so hard for me? Why are things easy for that person? We respond in this frustration, and we ask that question of God, why? That age-old question, why he does something that we don't, that we don't appreciate, that we don't want. Both anger and frustration are dangerous, but those are not the worst. Those do not cause the most anger. Something else comes out of our response, and that's distrust. Well, we may not originally say so, or we may not say it out loud. In our hearts, that distrust starts to brew. When God doesn't do things the way we want him to, Satan plants those seeds in our hearts that we ask, can God do this? If God isn't doing this, taking care of those he loves, well, Is he able to? And this dishonesty starts to grow. This distrust starts to grow. It starts to build within us. These questions start to build in our minds, and they go go beyond innocent questions to questioning the very power of our Lord. They may start out as simple things like, why do I struggle financially? Why do I struggle physically? Why do I struggle with my relationships? Why do I struggle physically? To remain faithful, reading your word every day. But quickly, those questions of why spiral down. They keep spiraling until we ask those questions of God. Until we stand before him and we say, God, I know better than you. I, I know how things should be. I know how things should be fixed. I know what would make things right. And we look at God's will, and we say, no, my will is greater. Again, these things are not things we say out loud. Most of us don't say these things other than in our hearts. But as we wrestle with these questions of seeing these good things happening to these bad people, we, we we certainly start to wonder. We certainly put, start to put those questions on God. We start to stand before him thinking that somehow we have a right to question him. The truth is, we don't have the measure to question God. See, when we look at God, when we look at right and wrong in this world, and we look at God, we we have a wide gray area, at least when it comes to ourselves. Well, it was just a white lie. Well, I just didn't help him that time. And we have this big, wide gray area except when it comes to someone else. Then it's really narrow, isn't it? But God, God is black or white. 
You're either perfect or you're a sinner. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. And so when we try to look at people in this world, when we pass judgment on people in this world, when we ask why God, we are doing so from a corrupted will, as sinful human beings. We are doing so without having the full picture, without willing to look at the full picture. We are doing so not knowing God's greater plan. And when we do so, when we question God, we're doing so as sinful human beings who deserve His punishment. But thanks be to God that He sent His Son. He sent Jesus into the world, not just to come to die and to go back to heaven, but He sent Jesus in this world to walk each step with us, to serve as the one who goes before us. Did you catch that in our gospel lesson today? He is our intercessor. He is the one who goes as our advocate, an advocate before us. He is the one who has our best interest in mind, and he goes before the Father. On our own, we cannot stand before God. On our own, our judgment scales are skewed. On our own, we are lost, caught in the prison of sin, shackled to the wall of death. With Christ, he breaks those shackles and tears those chains loose. With Christ, he blows that prison door off. And not with just some parole, not with some cheap trick, not just temporarily. But as he poured out his blood on the cross, he did it for each day, for each hour, for each minute that we knew this. He did it because we were worth it to him. And he did it because he loved us. He came and died on that cross. Lived that perfect life. Praying for his enemies. Celebrating his persecution. He lived that perfect life because we could not. And he lived that perfect life that we would live with him forever. Now Satan. Satan tries to twist us a little bit today. He makes us look at the world and look at those people we don't like. He makes us look at those little people as enemies. Even to the point that instead of praying for them, we might ask that we could smite them. Or curse them. But the truth is, only one enemy remains. And that enemy is Satan. But it's an enemy who has been stripped of his power. Satan no longer has power over us. Satan no longer has power to lead us away from God. He tries constantly. But as Christians who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, he has no power. He has been vanquished. And so at times as we go through this life, we will have people we consider enemies. We'll have people we'll have people who it seems are persecuting us, people who are persecuting us for our faith. We will have people who are who are making it awful hard to live. But in those times, the Lord invites us to come to him in prayer. Pray for our enemies, not just for their sake. At first you may think, well, we're praying just for their sake, but it's also for our sake. Because when we pray for our enemies, we humble our hearts. We nail down before our Lord and we say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. Just as this person needs my forgiveness, I need your forgiveness, Lord. When we pray for our enemies, it reminds us that Christ himself prayed for us when we were still his enemies. We were the unjust. We were the ones who did not deserve his blessing. Most of all, the blessing of the cross but still out of his love for us. That's exactly what he did. And so we rejoice. We rejoice because we know that the sufferings we face, the sufferings in this life, well, they're temporary. They're short term. They're things that are going to go away. And they're nothing compared to the joy that we will have in eternity. The sufferings that we face in this life are only temporary. The sufferings we face but they also draw us closer to our Lord. And they remind us each day of our need for His Holy Spirit in our hearts. 
Those sufferings remind us each day that our God is looking after us and that each blessing we have is a gift from Him. And those sufferings remind us that Jesus did suffer on the cross, that He did die, that He did give His life. But that's not where it ended. Instead, it ended with His resurrection. And our sufferings will not end in our death. Yes, we will die, we will go to the grave. But on the last day, with our Lord, because He rose, we will rise again. We will rise again and join Him in eternity. We will rise again and we will be set free from the pains of this world. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for our enemies. We pray for those who are enemies of you, those who we detest, who we consider rotten and bad. Because we know that you died for them just like you died for us. Help us, Lord, each day to look for opportunities to celebrate in our suffering, to celebrate our persecutions knowing that they are just short, that they are just temporary, that the best is yet to come. Lord, we pray that you would guide our footsteps, that we may ever know our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.